Welcome back to Storytime. We have had an eventful couple of weeks since the last time I saw you. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, I am uh, in need of a haircut. That's what I am. Um, but uh, I have three stories for you today. Um, two of them are very new stories that have just been written in the last couple of years. And... Um, and then the third one is an older story that I first encountered when I was teaching young people um, like yourselves. Um, it's been a very long time since I've done that. Um, I love working with young people. Um, I, uh, I think it's just about the best thing in the world because I think kids are the best audience in the world and they're the most imaginative actors I've ever run across. Um, but when I was teaching, um, there were so many of them. Have you ever looked around in your classroom and just gone, wow, there are so many kids in here? Um, and that's not a bad thing because kids individually are awesome, but I'm suspicious of anything in large groups. You know, like if somebody said, hey, would you like a ice cream sandwich? Then I'd be like, yes, that sounds amazing. And if they said, would you like 37 ice cream sandwiches? Then I'd be like, no, that's too many. No, thank you. You know, there was... Um, this one time I took a friend of mine down to New Orleans, this was years ago, to see her aunt and uncle, and they were free-range rabbit breeders, and we were so excited because we were going to get to see rabbits, um, and then the day we drove down, there was a big storm, and by the time we got there, they had brought all the rabbits inside, um, and then we weren't as excited anymore, um, because... Um, having 60 or 70 rabbits inside of a house um, isn't a very appealing thing. Um, you know, they say rabbits don't make a noise, but 60 or 70 rabbits do make a noise. They, they sound like an upset tummy. Mm -hmm. So, let's get to our stories. Our first story today is Corduroy Takes a Bow by Viola Davis. Now, the original corduroy books were written by Don Freeman a long time ago. Um, they were probably new books when Viola Davis was a little girl. And they asked Viola Davis to do a new take on the old story. And if you have not run across Viola Davis in your entertainment yet, you are in for a treat as you grow up because she is an amazing actress. We are very, very lucky to live in a time when Viola Davis is creating. Um, and how cool that they let her tell a story. So, this is Corduroy Takes a Bow. Story by Viola Davis with B.G. Hennessy. Pictures by Jody Wheeler. Based on the characters created by Don Freeman. It was just starting to snow when Lisa and her mother got off the bus in front of the theater. Lisa held corduroy tight as they walked up the steps. She had never been to a big theater like this before. Neither had corduroy. They had come to see a performance of Mother Goose Rhymes. In the lobby, people were picking up tickets. Ushers handed out programs. A brass chandelier hung from the ceiling that was painted with clouds. Have you ever been to the Fox Theater here? It sounds a lot like the Fox. Suddenly the lights flickered on and off. That means the play will start in a few minutes. We should find our seats, said Lisa's mother. Lisa held her mother's hand a little tighter and held Corduroy a little closer. The usher took their tickets and showed them where to sit. The seats are so soft, said Lisa. She put Corduroy on her lap and looked through the program. Yeah, this is definitely a nice theater if the seats are soft. Right before the play started, a very tall man sat down in front of Lisa. Mommy, whispered Lisa to her mother, I can't see. Here, dear, said her mother, we can fold our coats together and you can sit on top of them. As a tall person, I appreciate them being solution-minded there. When Lisa stood up to sit on the coats, the orchestra started to play. She forgot all about Corduroy. He slipped off her lap and fell underneath the seats in front of them. 
Now I can't see anything, said Corduroy. Maybe if I got closer to the music, I could see the stage. He peeked down the aisle and saw some stairs. When Corduroy got to the top step, the big red curtain went up and up and up. Corduroy was so startled that he lost his balance and tumbled into the orchestra pit. He looked around at all the musicians and thought, well, this is a good spot to hear the music, but now I can't see the stage at all. At the back of the orchestra, there was a tall set of drums. Maybe if I sat up there, I would have a better view, he thought. Quietly, he crawled through the orchestra, past feet, between instrument cases, and around music stands toward the drums. How did you get here, little fellow? The drummer whispered to Corduroy. You must be a prop from the play. Someone will be looking for you. He put Corduroy up on the ledge behind the drums. There was a chair off to one side behind the curtain. I could see better from there, thought Corduroy. But before he got to the chair, a stagehand tripped on him. Sorry, bear, said the stagehand. He put Corduroy on the table with the other props. The table was hard, not like Lisa's soft seat in the theater. Backstage was very busy. Actors were coming and going, changing costumes and getting their props. One actor almost grabbed Corduroy. I should find a safer spot, he decided, and he hid between the costumes. This is safe, he thought, but I'll never see anything from here. There was a tree with a basket in its branches in the wing, off to one side of the stage. I would be able to see from there, Corduroy thought, and he climbed up the tree and into the basket. Well, thought Corduroy, this is more like it. Not too high, not too low, just right. He settled in and watched the Mother Goose performance. I love the theater, said Corduroy. Right there with you, buddy. After a number of different scenes, the stage manager called out, Final scene, everyone! Take your places! What a polite stage manager. Stagehands quickly moved new scenery onto the stage while the actors went to stand in position. Suddenly, Corduroy's tree began moving right onto the stage. It started to grow. Up, up, up went the tree, the basket, and Corduroy. This is a very tall tree, said Corduroy, as he looked down at the stage far below. The tall tree made him think of the tall man who sat in front of Lisa. Corduroy wondered, how will I get back to Lisa if I'm up in this tree? On the stage below, Mother Goose started to sing. Rock-a-bye, baby, on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. You see where this is going? Off stage, a fan blew air into the branches of the tree. The cradle began to rock back and forth, up and down, back and forth, and up and down. Corduroy was getting dizzy. He held on to the sides of the cradle as it rocked faster and faster. Mother Goose kept singing. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And crack! The bow did break. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. Down, 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 King Corduroy, cradle and all. Before Corduroy knew what was happening, Mother Goose scooped him up for the curtain call. The audience clapped as the actors bowed. Corduroy bowed, too. After the curtain call, the cast took Corduroy backstage to the dressing room. Who does this bear belong to, they wondered. The usher brought Lisa backstage. Corduroy, there you are, said Lisa. How did you get on stage? I couldn't see, and I wanted to get a little closer, said Corduroy. Oh, Corduroy, said Lisa. You certainly got closer. 
The very next day, Lisa made a theater just for Corduroy. He could see everything from a nice, safe spot. The end. Oh, well, that takes me back. <laughs> I imagine all of you are missing theater as much as I am these days. And it is nice to read a story reminding me of how wonderful it is backstage with all the people that make the magic happen. My next story today is called, let me see, What Do You Do With a Chance? By Yobi, uh, by, I'm sorry, by Kobe Yamada. Illustrated by Mae Basum. One day, I got a chance. It just seemed to show up. It acted like it knew me, as if it wanted something. I didn't know why it was here. What do you do with a chance, I wondered. You see it? There's the little chance. It fluttered around me. It brushed up against me. It circled me as if it wanted me to grab it. I started to reach for it, but I was unsure and pulled back. So it flew away. I thought about it a lot. I wished I had taken my chance. I realized I had wanted it, but I still didn't know if I had the courage. When another chance came around, I wasn't so sure, but I decided to try. I went to reach for it, but I missed and fell. I was embarrassed. I felt foolish. It seemed like everyone was looking at me. I decided I never wanted to feel this way again. So after that, whenever a chance came along, I ignored it. And the more I ignored them, the less they came around. Until one day, I noticed that I hadn't seen a chance in quite a while. It was as if they had all disappeared. I started to worry, what if I don't get another chance? I knew I acted like I didn't care, but the truth was, I did. I still wanted to take a chance, but I was afraid, and I wasn't sure if I would ever be brave enough. And then I thought, Maybe I don't have to be brave all the time. Maybe I just need to be brave for a little while at the right time. I realized it was up to me. I promised myself that if I ever got another chance, I wasn't going to hold back. If I got another chance, I was going to be ready. Then, one seemingly ordinary day, I saw something shining far in the distance. Is it possible, I hoped? Could this be my chance? I had to find out. I ran as hard and as fast as I could toward it. I don't know how to explain it, but the second I let go of my fears, I was full of excitement. It wasn't that I was no longer afraid, but now my excitement was bigger than my fear. As I got closer, I could see that this was a really huge chance. Look how it fills up the whole page. It's the biggest chance we've seen. But this time, I was ready. As it came by, I reached out and grabbed it. I held on with all my might. It felt so good to soar, to fly, to be free. I now see that when I hold back, I miss out. And I don't want to miss out. There's just so much I want to see and do and discover.
So what do you do with a chance? You take it. Because it just might be the start of something incredible. The end. What a cool story. I love this book. And I love that all of the chances look like they're made out of origami. We could probably make chances ourselves. And I love that when you let go of fear, your excitement can be stronger than your fear. I also really like the idea of not having to be brave all the time, but being very brave sometimes. I feel like I could pull that off. So when I saw you two weeks ago, I read you a story called The Giving Tree. Um, but I had written an alternate ending to The Giving Tree. And, um, and I made that just for you guys to enjoy, but I put it on my website in case anybody had missed the story time when we were together and wanted the chance to read it at home. And it turns out a lot of people were interested in reading the alternate ending to that story. And so since I last saw you, about three million people have read the alternate ending to The Giving Tree. Um, and my favorite thing about that is that the original Giving Tree story, which is a beautiful story, is still right there for anyone to enjoy. And then there's the thing I used my imagination, imagination to create. And maybe you guys at home have already written your own alternate endings to your favorite stories. Um, but I think it's important for people to remember, and um, particularly people with Twitter accounts, that creating something new doesn't make the old wonderful thing go away. We just end up with more wonderful things. And that's pretty awesome. So, today, I have a new alternate ending for you. This book that I was introduced to um, when I was working with uh, three to five year olds and we did a stage adaptation of the story and even then when it got to about the last third of it I went wait what um, and so I'm very glad to have the opportunity to tell this story it's called the rainbow fish keeps his scales and it is based on the book rainbow fish by Marcus Fister um, and in this version, we have a little word bubble there, and it says, I won't diminish myself for the comfort of others. And we should find out what he means by that. Do you know that word diminish? It means to make things less. Like, um, if I were diminishing the light on pizza cactus, then I would be dimming the lights or maybe turning them out entirely. And sometimes, People ask you to diminish part of what makes you special because other people find it confusing or um, maybe they're just a sourpuss. Um, and it's very important to, to not diminish what makes you you just because somebody else says, eh, well, I don't like that. Let's read the story. A long way out in the deep blue sea, there lived a fish. Not just an ordinary fish, but the most beautiful fish in the entire ocean. His scales were every shade of blue and green and purple, with sparkling silver scales among them. You see how they shine? In my ring light? The other fish were amazed at his beauty. They called him Rainbow Fish. Come on, rainbow fish, they would call. Come and play with us. But the rainbow fish would just glide past, proud and silent, letting his scales shimmer. One day, a little blue fish followed after him. Rainbow fish, he called. Wait for me. Please give me one of your shiny scales. They are so wonderful and you have so many. 
You want me to give you one of my special scales? Who do you think you are? cried the rainbow fish. Get away from me! Well, that was a bit much. Shocked, the little blue fish swam away. He was so upset, he told all of his friends what happened. From then on, no one would have anything to do with the rainbow fish. They turned away when he swam by. And why do you think they turned away? It's not because of his glittering scales. It's because he was kind of a meanie about it. What good were the dazzling, shimmering scales with no one to admire them? Now he was the loneliest fish in the entire ocean. One day he poured out his troubles to the starfish. I really am beautiful. Why doesn't anybody like me? I can't answer that for you, said the starfish. But if you go beyond the coral reef to a deep cave, you will find the wise octopus. Maybe he can help you. The rainbow fish found the cave. It was very dark inside, and he couldn't see anything. Then suddenly, two eyes caught him in their glare, and the octopus emerged from the darkness. I have been waiting for you, said the octopus with a deep voice. The waves have told me your story. This is my advice. Give a glittering scale to each of the other fish. You will no longer be the most beautiful fish in the sea, but you will discover how to be happy. I... I can't, the rainbow fish started to say, but the octopus had already disappeared into a dark cloud of ink, which is the octopus version of hanging up on someone and is a very abrupt and rude way to end a conversation. Then, Rainbow Fish heard a voice from behind him. Excuse me, little Rainbow Fish. The Rainbow Fish turned to see the Fabulous Catfish. The Fabulous Catfish was very popular. His dinner parties were legendary because his entire body was covered in taste buds, so he had a notably refined palate. He was also known for his charitable giving to nonprofit organizations. What did that octopus just say to you? The fabulous catfish inquired, seeming a bit exasperated. The octopus told me to give away all my glittering scales so that I could make friends, said the rainbow fish. Oh, give me strength, sighed the fabulous catfish. First of all, we do not take life advice from reclusive cephalopods who live alone in dark caves and only talk to waves. I bet that starfish sent you here, didn't she? Yes, said the rainbow fish. And did you notice that starfish was all by herself? That girl has no friends because she is shady. It always has been. We were in school together. Rainbow Fish, when someone tells you how to be, you've got to consider the source. Now, I've seen you around, the fabulous catfish continued. I've noticed you tend to swim solo these days. Why is that? The other fish don't want to play with me because they're jealous of my glittering scales, said the rainbow fish. Oh, is that the reason? said the fabulous catfish, giving the fish equivalent of arching an eyebrow. Or is it because you got a little full of yourself and forgot to appreciate others? The rainbow fish considered this. He felt guilty. You need to understand, rainbow fish, every creature in the sea has something that makes them special, just as special as your scales. So when someone tells you that, they're, that your scales are beautiful, instead of getting a big head about it, say thank you and give a compliment in return. Tell the lobster how strong her claws are. Tell the shark he has excellent teeth. Sharks love it when you notice their teeth. You have very impressive whiskers, said the rainbow fish, trying out an accolade. Thank you, and you have very soulful eyes. No one had ever complimented the rainbow fish's eyes before. Compliments were fun. Now, said the fabulous catfish, I want you to look for what is exceptional in others. When you celebrate what makes each of us distinctive, 
you become part of a community. Thank you, fabulous catfish, said the rainbow fish, excited to begin his new approach. I'm sure glad I didn't listen to that rude octopus. I'm glad too, rainbow fish. Go out there and glitter. And remember, it's important to consider the feelings of others, but you should never feel obligated to diminish yourself for someone else's comfort. There's room enough in the sea for each of us to be amazing in our own way. The rainbow fish began the journey home, appreciating his wonderful neighbors as he traveled. Hello, mackerel! You're the fastest swimmer I've ever seen! Hi there, squid! I've heard, I heard you have three hearts! That is so cool! May I ask you a few follow-up questions? What's up, prawn? You can change colors! That's awesome! Do you have a favorite? Hello, mussels! I appreciate that you have a wide range of viewpoints which you express without disparaging each other's perspectives. And hello, little blue fish! You don't need one of my scales to be special. You're a desert pup fish. You can thrive in water up to 113 degrees. That's some superhero stuff. You are awesome. The most amazing thing began to happen. When the other creatures of the sea spoke of rainbow fish, his dazzling scales were no longer the first thing they mentioned. It was his kindness and positivity, and how wonderful it was to spend time with him. It didn't take long for others to follow his example. The shady starfish even got over herself and joined in the fun. The octopus came by every now and then, but he was really committed to doing his own thing. Some creatures are just naturally introverted, and that's totally fine as long as they feel comfortable reaching out when they need to. At long last, Rainbow Fish was part of a community where everyone felt appreciated and acknowledged for the things that made them unique. And that's something far more beautiful than glittering scales. The end. And that's the Rainbow Fish Keeps His Scales. So if you have a copy of Rainbow Fish at home, you can read the original ending, and you can read the alternate ending, and then what an exciting conversation that would be between you and the grown-up that reads you stories, whoever in your house loves you best of all. And thank you very much for joining me again.